So in this lecture, we're going to look at momentum, collisions, and impulse. So the textbook reference for this lecture are sections 9.3, 9.4, and 9.5 of your Halliday, Resnick, and Walker textbook. First of all, a quick recap of the most important ideas from the last lecture. In the last lecture, we were looking at how to calculate the center of mass. So we saw for discrete objects, the center of mass can be found using that the x location of the center of mass is equal to 1 over the total mass times the sum of the mass of each of the components times the position of each of those components. And we saw that a similar equation applies in each dimension. For continuous objects, we need to break our big object up into lots of little small increments, each with a mass dm, and we can find the center of mass using 1 over m is equal to the integral of x dm. Now we saw that the velocity of the center of mass is given by a similar equation. The velocity of the center of mass is given by 1 over m times the sum of the masses multiplied by the velocities of each of the particles. And we saw that Newton's second law also applies to systems. So the acceleration of the center of mass is given by the sum of the external forces divided by the total mass. So if there is no external forces acting upon the system, then the acceleration of the center of mass is zero. Okay, so this lecture we're going to start looking at linear momentum. So momentum can be calculated using the formula P is equal to M times V, where V is the velocity of the object and M is the mass. So it's a vector, so you can see it's got the little vector subscript over the top, and the units can be written as kilogram meters per second or as newton seconds. So it's fast to write newton seconds, so maybe write it that way. So part of why momentum is useful is that it can easily be related to the forces applied to the system. So we know Newton's second law, the net force is equal to the mass times the acceleration, which is equal to the mass times the derivative of the velocity with respect to time. Now, if as long as the mass isn't changing, we can put the mass up here with the velocity and we end up with the net force is equal to dp dt, or just the derivative of of the momentum with respect to time. So let's look at an example problem. So in this problem we've got a block with a mass of two kilograms which is initially traveling at three meters per second due north. So u is equal to 3.0 meters per second north. And we're told that a force f is equal to one newton directed towards the south, so let's put that as minus 1.0 newtons, acts on the block for 10 seconds. So part one asks us, what is the initial momentum of the block? So we can use, well, P is equal to mv. In this case, because it's initial, we'll use the initial velocity, so we'll use mu. So this is equal to 2 times 3. And so this is equal to 6 newton seconds, and it's a vector, so we do need to give the direction. So that's north. And then part 2 asks us, what is the final momentum of the block? So we know that F is equal to dp dt, and so we can write this as F dt is equal to dp, and so we're integrating from t equals 0 to t, and we're going from p initial to p final. And we've just calculated the initial p here. So we can say, well, f from 0 to t is equal to p from p initial to p final. So f times t is equal to p final minus p initial, which tells us that p final is equal to p initial plus the force times the time. So p initial is 6 newton seconds north. And then we've got, we'll take north as positive. So the force, that's minus 1.0. And the time was for 10 seconds. And so this is also north. So we've got 6 minus 10, which is minus 4 newton seconds north. Or if we want, we could write it as 4 newton seconds south. 
because that's what the negative here means. It means that it's heading south. And then part three asks us, what is the final velocity of the block? So we can use that the P final is equal to MV final. And so V final is equal to P final over M. So this is 4 divided by 2, which is equal to 2. And the direction is south. So that's meters per second south. So let's consider the momentum of a system of particles. So if we have a system that is composed of n discrete particles, then the net momentum just comes about from the sum of each of the momentums. So that's like the net force acting on the an object is just the sum of all the discrete forces. We can do the same thing with momentum. We get that the net momentum is the sum of each of these discrete momentums. And so we can write this in symbols this way with this sum sign and we know that momentum is just equal to the mass of the particle times the velocity of the particle and we're summing from 1 to n. So to practice using this homework set 3 for 1a question 1 and for higher 1a also question 1 but this is actually quite powerful so because we have seen before that the velocity of the center of mass is equal to 1 over the mass the, where the capital M here stands for the total mass of the system which is the sum of each of the individual masses and that's times the sum of the individual masses times the individual velocities. So you can see there's lots of similarities between these two. In fact, the only thing which is different is this 1 over m. So this allows us to write that the net momentum of a system is equal to the total mass of the system times the velocity of the center of mass. So let's have a look at why this can be so powerful. So Last lecture, we said that Newton's second law applies to a system of particles. So the net force is equal to the mass times the acceleration of the center of mass, where the acceleration of the center of mass is equal to 1 over the total mass times the sum of each of the individual particles' mass times the acceleration. So if we take the time derivative of our equation that the net momentum is equal to the total mass times the velocity of the center of mass that we just derived on the last slide. Then we get, taking the derivative of this, the derivative of the net momentum is dp net dt, and the derivative of the mass times the velocity of the center of mass is equal to the mass times the derivative of the center of mass, but the derivative of the velocity of the center of mass is just the acceleration of the center of mass. So you can see that that is equal to the net force. So we've got that the net force acting is equal to the derivative of the net momentum. So just like we had that the force acting gave us a derivative of the momentum, this whole thing applies to systems as well as to single particles. So let's use this to solve this same problem that we solved last lecture because it's just a slightly different way of viewing this same problem. Okay, so we've got the car with the mass of 1.25 tonnes. So we had this car here. Let's call this mass 1 is equal to 1.25 tonnes and we've got that U1 is equal to 30 kilometres per hour. And then it's rammed by a second car here, which has a mass of two tons and is traveling at 60 kilometers per hour. So in part one, we're asked, what is the initial momentum of the system? So P net is equal to M1U1 plus M2U2. So this is equal to 1,250. So tons here, one ton is 1,000 kilograms times U1. So U1 is equal to 30 kilometers per hour, which is equal to 30 over 3.6 meters per second, which is equal to 8.33 meters per second. So this is times 8.33 plus M2, which is 2,000 kilograms, times U2, and U2 is equal to 60 kilometers per hour, which is 60 over 3.6 meters per second, which is equal to 16.67 
meters per second. So this is times 16.67. So solving this on the calculator, we get 43,750 newtons seconds, which is equal to 44 kilonewton seconds. Now part two says, what is the final momentum of the cars after the collision? Okay, now the net momentum doesn't change because there's no external forces acting on the system. So because F net is equal to DP net DT, and this is equal to zero, P net must not change. So we've still got 44 kilonewton seconds. So we should have given a direction here. So in direction cars are traveling initially because the, the direction they're traveling doesn't actually change. And then part three says, what is the speed of each of the cars after the collision? Okay, so the two cars stick together. So because the momentum's not changing, we can say, well, M1 U1 plus M2 U2 is equal to M1 V final plus M2 V final. So this tells us that V final is equal to M1 U1 plus M2 U2, which is just our P net, divided by M1 plus M2. That was just pulling the final velocity out as a common factor here and dividing by that. And so that is equal to 43,750 divided by 2,000, that's M2, plus 1,250, that's M1. And when we solve that, we get 13.46 meters per second, which if we want to convert back into kilometers per hour is 48 kilometers per hour. So we get the same answer as we did last lecture, but with a slightly different method by using momentum rather than the velocity of the center of mass. So this brings us to impulse. So we can rearrange our equation for the net force. So we had F, is equal to dp net dt. This was also the net force. So we can rearrange this and write, well, dp is equal to f times dt. So we actually find it useful to define impulse j, though it's sometimes written as i, as the integral of f dt. So this is the integral over time, so going from the initial time to the final time. And so combining this equation with this equation, we can see that the integral of dp with respect to time, that's integrating this side with respect to time, which it just gives us the final momentum minus the initial momentum, which is just the change of momentum, is equal to the integral of f dt, which is just the impulse. So what's useful is that the impulse is also equal to the change in momentum. Okay, so we can use impulse with graphs as well. So here we've got a graph showing the force versus the time. And we have just derived that the integral of f dt is equal to the change in the momentum. So in this question, a car traveling along a straight road experiences the net force shown in the diagram. It acts in the same direction as the car travels. What is the change in momentum of the car? So we need to calculate this. And then we're asked what average force acts on the car over the time interval would result in the same change of momentum. So if instead of having this variable force, we had a constant one, what would the constant force have to be? Okay, so the change in momentum is equal to the integral of force with time. So we know that the integral is just the area under a force versus time graph. So we can start by working out this area here. So this is two seconds at minus 200 newtons. So this one here is minus 400. So we can say, well, minus delta P is equal to minus 400. And then we've got this triangle here, which has got a length one and height of minus 200. So that's minus 100. And then we've got this big triangle here where we've 
finally gone positive. And so this triangle is going from three seconds up to eight seconds. So that's got a length of five and it's got a height of 1000. So plus five times 1000 divided by two. And then we've got this rectangle, which goes from eight to 10 seconds. So it's got a length of two seconds and a height of 1000. So that's plus 2000. So we can work out what this is. So this is equal to 4000 newton seconds as the change in momentum. So if I want to know, well, what's an average force would give this same thing, I can say, well, F average times T is equal to the change in momentum. So F average is equal to 4000 divided by the time, and this was a 10 second time interval, so this would be equal to 400 newtons. So let's just check that. If we sketch on 400 newtons here, just eyeballing it, it does look like that area is similar to this area minus this area. So that seems like a fairly reasonable answer. So to practice this for 1A students, you should try homework set three, question three. And for higher 1A students, you should try set three, question four. Okay, so here's a problem to try. A paratrooper whose chute fails to open lands in snow. He is hurt slightly. Had he landed on bare ground, the stopping time would have been 10 times shorter and the collision lethal. Does the presence of snow increase, decrease, or leave unchanged the value of A, the paratrooper's change in momentum? So we've got that the impulse, force times time, is equal to the change in momentum. And the change in momentum is equal to the mass times the final velocity minus the initial velocity. Now, the final velocity and the initial velocity are not changing, and the paratrooper's mass is also not changing. So the paratrooper's change in momentum remains the same. We're then asked about the impulse stopping the paratrooper. So the impulse is equal to the force times the time, and it's the same as the change in momentum. So if the change in momentum wasn't changing here, can't be changing here either. So this one here is the same. And then the force stopping the paratrooper, well, if the time is larger, but the change in momentum is the same, then the force is going to be smaller. So the presence of the snow increased the time, and so it decreased the force. So here's another problem to try. The figure shows a ball bouncing off a wall without any change in its speed. So it's got some speed coming in and it's the same speed going out. Consider the change in momentum, which is delta P, in the ball's linear momentum. Okay, so we're going to consider the x direction first. So we know that the change in momentum in the x direction is equal to m times vx final minus vx initial. And when we split the velocity into x components, the x component is not changing because this speed is the same. And so we can show that initially is v. This is 90 minus theta because that angle is theta. So this is theta up here. So Vx is equal to V sine theta. And finally, we've got the speed going this way. This is theta. So that tells us this angle up here is theta. So this is also V sine theta. And you can see that they're both, in both cases, heading towards the right. So the change in x momentum is zero. Now, is py positive, negative, or zero? This does change. You can see this is the initial velocity, and this is the final velocity. So they're equal in magnitude. They're both v cos theta, but one's going down. The initial one's going down, and then the final one's going up. So taking the positive y direction as up the screen, we've got the final velocity is up the screen. The initial velocity is down the screen. And so when we add these two together like this, we get a positive one away up the screen. So this is going to be positive if we take up the screen as positive. And so what is the direction of delta P? Well, it's just the y direction here. So it's up the screen. 
that's in the positive y direction. Okay, so here's this question, but now we're doing it quantitatively. So a continuous stream of bores is thrown at a wall at an angle of 30 degrees. So this angle here is 30 degrees. Um, the bores each have a mass of 100 grams. So the mass is equal to 100 grams, which is grams, which is 0 0.100 kilograms, and have a speed of three meters per second. The collisions last for 0 0.020 seconds. So time for the collision is 0 0.020 seconds. And one ball hits the wall every 0.5 seconds. Okay, so we're asked what is the impulse during each collision? So we've got that the impulse force times time is equal to the change in momentum. So as we were discussing last time, the x direction doesn't change, it's only the y direction that changes. So the change in the momentum is equal to the mass times the final velocity in the y direction minus the initial velocity in the y direction. And so if we split our velocity up into an x and a y component, we can see this is theta here, and so we've got v cos theta is the initial velocity in the y direction, which is equal to 3 times cos of 30, and that is equal to 2.598 meters per second. And finally, it's got the same magnitude, but it's heading in the opposite direction. So we can write this as m, and then we've got v cos 30 minus minus v cos 30. So this is equal to m, which is 0 0.100, times v cos 30, which is 2.598, and there's two of these. So solving that... I end up with 0 0.52 newton seconds away from the wall. Okay, now part B says, what is the average force on the wall during the collision? Okay, so now we're going to be using this equation, but the time that we're doing is during the co collision. So we can say, well, the average force is equal to the change in momentum divided by the time, which is 0 0.52 divided by the collision time is 0 0.020. And so this is equal to 26 newtons away from the wall. Part C then says, what is the average force on the wall? So to get the average force over all, we'll need to do the change in momentum, but the time rather than being just during the collision now is the time between the balls hitting the wall. So we've got F is equal to 0 0.52 divided by 0 0.50, and that is equal to 1.0 newtons away from the wall. So this we'd expect to be a lot less than this because there's a lot of time when there is no ball applying a force to the wall. So this brings us to a really important rule for physics, the conservation of linear momentum. So because we know that the change in momentum is equal to the integral of f dt, then if there is no external force acting, if this f is zero on either an object or a system of objects, then there can be no change in the linear momentum of the object or the system of objects. So that means that the final linear momentum must be the same as the initial linear momentum. So to have a go at using this, homework set three for 1A question 14 and for higher 1A question 19. So here's a problem. A soccer player kicks a soccer ball with a mass of 0.5 kilograms that is initially at rest. So u is equal to zero, m is equal to 0 0.45. So from that we can see that the initial momentum is mu is zero newton seconds. The 
foot of the player is in contact with the ball for 3 times 10 to the minus 3 seconds and the force of the kick is given by this expression here. And we're asked to A, find the magnitude of the impulse of the ball due to the kick. Okay, so for part A, we know that the impulse is equal to the integral of f dt. And so this is equal to 6 times 10 to the 6 t minus 2 times 10 to the 9 t squared dt. And we're going from 0 to 3 times 10 to the minus 3 seconds. So integrating this, we end up with... 3 times 10 to the 6 t squared minus 2 times 10 to the 9 t cubed on 3. And this is from 0 to 3 times 10 to the minus 3. And so we've got 3 times 10 to the 6 times 3 times 10 to the minus 3 squared minus 2 times 10 to the 9 times 3 times 10 to the minus 3 cubed over 3. And solving this, we end up with 27 minus 18, which is equal to 9 newton seconds. And it only asked us for the magnitude in this case. So part B then asks for the average force on the ball from the player's foot during the period of contact. So we've got that the, so we know that the average force is equal to the total impulse divided by the time. So that is equal to 9, which we've just calculated here, divided by the 3 times 10 to the minus 3 seconds. And that gives us 3,000 newtons. And that would be in the direction of the kick, but it only asks us for the magnitude. Part C then asks us for the maximum for force on the ball from the player's foot during the period of contact. So if we want to find the maximum of the force, we're going to have to find the turning point. So we'll have to do df dt is equal to 0. So taking the derivative of this, we've got 6 times 10 to the 6. And then the derivative of this is minus 4 times 10 to the 9 t. And we want this equal to 0, which tells us that t is equal to 6 times 10 to the 6 over 4 times 10 to the 9, which occurs at 1.5 times 10 to the minus 3 seconds, which kind of makes sense because that's right in the middle of this kick period. Okay, so we know when it occurs, so now we find, need to find out what it is. So we substitute this time into this e equation here. So this is 6 times 10 to the 6 times 1.5 times 10 to the minus 3 minus 2 times 10 to the 9 times 1.5 times 10 to the minus 3 squared. And when we substitute that in, we get 4,500 newtons. So we should check that that's at bigger than the average, which it is. So that looks around about right. Okay, part D, we're then asked to find the ball's velocity immediately after it loses contact with the player's foot. So we know the initial momentum was zero, and we know that the change in momentum is equal to the impulse. And we've calculated the impulse in part one, so that's equal to nine. And so the change in momentum is the final momentum minus the initial momentum, but the initial momentum was zero. And so that tells us that the mass times the final velocity is equal to nine. And so the final velocity is equal to 9 divided by the mass, and the mass was 0 0.45. So we've got 9 divided by 0 0.45. And so solving that, we have 20 meters per second as the final magnitude of the ball's velocity. Okay, so this one's a little bit challenging. A two-ended rocket that is initially stationary on a frictionless floor, so we know that u is equal to 0, with its center at the origin of an x-axis. So the center's here. The rocket consists of a central block C of mass 6 kilograms. So we can say 
the mass of C is equal to 6 kilograms and blocks L and R each of mass 2 kilograms. So mass of L is equal to mass of R is equal to 2 kilograms on the left and right sides. So a small explosion can shoot either of the side blocks away from block C along the x-axis. So here is the sequence. At time t equals 0, block L is shot to the left with a speed of 3 meters per second relative to the velocity that the explosion gives the rest of the block. Okay, so at t equals 0, we have that the velocity of L relative to the rest, so let's call the rest B for block, which is equal to the velocity of L minus the velocity of the block, remembering our relative velocity formula, is equal to 3.00 meters per second. And then step two, at T equals 0 0.80 seconds, the right block is shot to the right with a speed of 3, three meters per second relative to the velocity that block C then has. So the velocity of R relative to C is equal to the velocity of R minus the velocity of C, and this is equal to 3 meters per second, and that's to the right. This velocity was to the left, so we really should put a negative sign there to show that it's, it's traveling towards the left this way. So then we're asked, this is some time later, at time t equals 2.08, sorry, t equals 2.80 seconds, what is the velocity of c equal to and the, what is the position of its center? So to answer this question, we're going to need to make the assumption that no external forces are acting. So no external which tells us that momentum is conserved. So initially, since the speed of everything is zero, we know that the initial momentum must be equal to mass times the initial speed, which is zero. So this tells us that momentum is always zero. Okay, so let's consider this first explosion where we had the one on the left separate from the other two blocks. So we know that zero, that's the initial momentum, is equal to the mass of block L times the velocity of block L plus the mass of block C plus the mass of block R, that's these other two blocks, times the velocity of these blocks. Now we have masses, so we can substitute in the mass of L is 2, so this is 2 times VL plus mass of block C is 6 and mass of R is 2, so this is 8 times VB. Now what we can do is rearrange this equation up here, so this tells us that VB is equal to VL plus 3. So we can substitute that in here. So this is equal to 2VL plus 8 times VL plus 3, which we can write as 3 times 8, that's 24. So we've got minus 24 is equal to 2VL plus 8VL, which is 10VL, which tells us that VL is equal to minus 2.4 meters per second. So we expect it to be negative because it's going to the left. Okay, so now what we can do is calculate the velocity of blocks C and R. So the velocity of the block, which is the two of them stuck together, is equal to VL, which is minus 2.4 plus 3, which is equal to 0 0.60 meters per second, and that's to the right which is what the positive sign's indicating there. Okay, so we've gotten to the end of this one, and now we have this second explosion that occurs. So 
we also assume that during the second explosion, there's no external forces. All these forces are internal, so momentum is conserved. So we can, we'll ignore block L now. So we'll consider the initial momentum of these two blocks just before the explosion. So just before the second ex explosion. We've got the these two blocks which have a mass of 2 plus 6. So we've got 8 times the initial speed, 0 0.60. That's the initial momentum. It needs to be the same as the momentum after the collision. So that's mass of C, which the central block has a mass of 6 kilograms times the velocity of C plus the mass of the... R, which is 2 kilograms, times the velocity of R. So this is what conservation of momentum tells us. And what the relative velocity equation tells us is that we can rearrange this a little bit and write V of R is equal to 3 plus V of C. So let's substitute in here for V of R. So we've got 8 times 0 0.6 which is equal to 4.8 is equal to 6 VC plus 2 times 3.00 plus VC. And so we've got 4.8 is equal to 6 VC plus 6 plus 2 VC. And so we've got 4.8 minus 6 which is equal to minus 1.2 is equal to 8 times VC, which tells us that VC is equal to minus 0 0.15 meters per second. So we were asked to find the velocity of block C after these explosions. And this is what we found here. The negative sign indicates that it's to the left. So um, we can write this as 0 0.15 meters per second to the left. Okay, so that was part A. Part B asked us to find the position of the center. Now we could consider the center of mass and use that to calculate it, but it's probably faster in this case to just use uh, equations that describe the motion. So we just need to work out how fast the central block is moving and when. So at t equals 0, the central block has this speed vb, which is 0 0.60 meters per second, and it travels that fast for 0 0.80 seconds. So the displacement in the first 0 0.8 seconds is 0 0.80 times the 0 0.60. And then after the first 0.8 seconds, until the end of the 2.80 seconds, which is a two second interval, it's traveling at 0 0.15, so minus 0 0.15. So we're just doing the speed times the time for this 2.80 second time interval. And solving that, we end up with 0 0.18 meters. So it's traveled 0 0.18 meters to the right. In that first 2.80 second time interval. Okay, so this is an interesting problem. In the Olympiad of 708 BC, some athletes competing in the standing long jump used handheld weights called halters to lengthen their jump. The weights were swung up in front before liftoff and then swung down and thrown backwards during the flight. Suppose a modern 78 kilogram long jumper similarly uses two 5.50 kilogram halters, throwing them horizontally to the rear at his maximum height, such that their horizontal velocity is zero relative to the ground. So let his liftoff velocity be given by this expression and with or without the halters. So the liftoff velocity is the same. And assume that he lands at the liftoff level. What distance would the use of halters add to his range? Okay, so let's sketch a little diagram of what's going on. So without the halters, the long jumper lifts off 
and follows the normal, his center of mass will follow the normal path. Now, with the halters at maximum height, which is midway through the flight, he's throwing the halters and he's throwing them backwards this way, which is going to give him some additional momentum this way. So that is shown relative to the long jumper because we're told that the halters move with zero relative velocity to the ground. Okay, so he'll have additional forwards momentum, which is going to increase his horizontal speed for the second half of the flight. So he'll end up going an extra distance like this. And what the question has asked us to calculate is the difference in range here. Now there isn't going to be any difference in range in the first half of the flight. So all we need to focus on is calculating the difference in range for the second half of the flight. But we do know from symmetry, because the weight force is the only thing which is working to accelerate him in the vertical direction, that he takes the same time to get to maximum height as he does to get to from maximum height to the minimum height. So let's start by calculating how long it takes him to get from maximum height to back to the ground. So time from max height. To ground but because we know that at max height v is equal to zero and we know the initial velocity we'll actually calculate the time from the ground to the maximum height and just assume that these are the same so time to max height we'll use our kinematic equation vy is equal to uy plus a y t and so we can say t is equal to, now at maximum height, v is zero. So this is zero. So t is equal to uy over ay. And I've got a negative sign there. But uy, he is moving upwards at 4.0 meters per second. And the acceleration is downwards. So this is minus 9.8. So solving this, I get 0 0.408 seconds to maximum height and that tells me 0 0.408 seconds back down as well. Now I know without the halters that the horizontal velocity doesn't change. So without halters, Vx is equal to 9.5 meters per second. So I can easily calculate the range without halters by from maximum height because that's where the difference is, um, by simply multiplying the time by the speed. So without halters, range is equal to 0 0.408 times 9.5, which gives me 3.876 meters. So I've literally calculated this distance here, and that is 3.876 meters. So now I'm going to worry about what happens when he throws the holders. Now I know when he throws the holders that momentum must be conserved because there's no external forces acting. This is an internal force applied on the holder, which is part of the system, by the athlete. So um, assuming momentum is conserved as no external forces act horizontally during the throw. So we'll assume momentum is conserved. So the mass of the man plus the mass of the holders times the initial velocity, which is ux, which we know is the 9.5, is going to be equal to the mass of the man plus the final velocity of the man in the x direction plus the mass of the holders times the final velocity of the holders in the x direction. So what I'm trying to find is this vx, the final velocity. So let's rearrange this and write, well, vx is equal to the mass of the man plus the mass of the holders times ux minus this thing, the mass of the holders, times the velocity of the holders, 
and then I'm going to have to divide by my mass of man. So now we've got an equation and we can just substitute in. So the mass of the man is 78 kilograms and the mass of the holders. Now we were told that the mass of the holders is 5.5 kilograms but that there's two of them. So we're going to have to double that. So mass of the holders is equal to 2 times 5.50 which will equal 11.0 kilograms. So this is plus 11. Now the initial speed of the man and the halters is just the horizontal velocity. So that's times 9.5. And now we need to subtract off the mass of the holders, which is the 11 kilograms, times the final speed of the holders. Now it tells us in the question that, that their horizontal velocity is zero relative to the ground. So I can, these velocities are all relative to the ground. This is the takeoff velocity relative to the ground. So I'm going to put zero in for that. And then I divide by the mass of the man, which is 78. And so solving this, I get 10.8 meters per second. So now I know how fast the man is traveling as he descends. So I can get the range the same way I did here, just multiply the time by the speed. So the range with the halters is equal to 0 0.408, the time, times 10.8, and this gives me 4.423 meters. So I now know that this distance is equal to 4.423 meters. But what I've been asked to calculate is this distance here, the difference between them. So this tells me that difference is equal to 4.423 minus the 3.876. And solving this gives me the 0 0.55 meters. So he manages to go an extra 0.55 meters with the halters than without them.